You will arrive at 10.48. All right, I'm on my way, running a little late, which is unlike me to see Sophia, friend and coffin maker extraordinaire. This is my friend Sophia, and she makes coffins, among other things. Mm -hmm. And um, how did we meet? Um, well, we both followed each other on social media, and then we both randomly moved to like within half an hour of each other at the same time. That's right. Or like yeah, you so were a bit before me. When... Like a week. Really? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So I I was following Sophia online when I still lived in the states. And then I moved to Cornwall, and I mm. think I messaged you being like, can I mm. drive to you and get a coffin from you? Right? You didn't actually contact me at all. Really? I, I think I did. Did you? Because I thought I contacted <laughs> you and was like, look, I've just moved down to Dorset. Are you? No, in? no. Because, oh, really? <laughs> yes. So, to set the record straight, I did contact Sophia. And I said, because I wanted to buy a coffin, and I was going to drive to where you were living before, which was Wales. I'm going to have to check this out, by the way. I'm going to have to verify no, this. No, good luck scrolling all the way up. <laughs> You're not going to do that. Um, but then, that's how I learned that you were moving, I think, I think, to Bridport, to the, the mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. I didn't um, just say I was moving to Dorset on my social media. No, I don't think so. No, I seriously <laughs> don't think so. Because, okay, anyway... However it happened, um, uh, we knew each other online, and then we met in real life because we just happened to move to the same place. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and when I moved down, um, I was like, you know what, I, I don't really know anyone, but I really would like to be Emily's friend. <laughs> so, and we're friends now. Yeah. And you literally came over like the day after we moved in. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Do you I remember? Didn't know. No. I mean, I remember coming over, but I didn't know that I came yeah. over the day after yeah. you moved. I was so keen. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, though. I had no friends. <laughs> you were my first friend. Oh, I think. Yeah. yay! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we are in mm -hmm. her workshop right now and surrounded by beautiful basketry. Is that the language? Yeah. Basketry yeah. and coffin tree. <laughs> That's a good one. Or, and or wicker work as well. Wicker work. Oh, Some I like that. Ones. And now I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Sure. So, yeah, so I've been trading for four years and um, I work mostly with families directly um, and sometimes I work with funeral directors as well. Mm -hmm. So, mostly what happens is people find me online or they get a recommendation through a friend, they call me up, and then if yeah, most of the people use funeral directors, so then I say, well, you know, what's the funeral date, what are the measurements, and then we go from there, and, and if there's time, then um, then I invite people to come and help make the coffin with me. So I've got someone, and maybe their little 10-year-old son coming over in a couple of weeks, for example, um, but it's it can be a really incredible thing to do for the family members, because they get to have an embodied involvement in the coffin before their loved one lies in it and before, I mean, yeah, it can kind of s sometimes to take a bit of anxiety out of mm -hmm. the apprehension of seeing the coffin arrive at the funeral mm -hmm. or, you know, turn up, uh, you know, see the coffin for the first time. Um, because they're used to it and they've had a hand in actually making yeah. it so they're, it's exactly. like a familiar object. Yeah, exactly, mm. yeah. 
and somehow having a direct relationship with me helps it feel a bit more of a personal experience and a bit more like somehow like they have more control in the situation mm. which can be incredibly feel like an incredibly uncontrollable you know death you can't control it really mm -hmm. um and the fear that comes along with being out of control in that way can be reduced through you know all the plethora the amazing plethora of ways that families can be involved in funerals nowadays mm. yeah so sometimes most of the time people just come and um, we for a couple of hours, we mm -hmm. have a cup of tea, mm. if they have the physical capacity, the emotional capacity, the logistical time capacity, but also um, sometimes people will book in to do sort of like a week workshop, so they'll come and they'll make a coffin from start to finish alongside wow. me. Yeah, I've never had anyone make one for themselves like that, mm. but I've had people make them for, you know, mothers and... Um, friends and yeah all start businesses you know people are really inspired by what I do and they feel really passionate about doing the same sometimes and that's really it's a real joy because that's what I did mm. I kind of got the bug got the idea and I just like leapt into that reality and I was so I'm so grateful that um someone was who had a flourishing business said yeah you just come and learn from me and yeah, we might be competitors, and but actually competition is healthy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more willow coffins that are out there and that people see, the more demand there'll be. Mm. And that's how he, he, you know, he was also given an end to the industry as well. So it is a balance because obviously, mo well, not obviously, but about 90% of the coffins are brought in from China and from Poland. 90% so, yeah like a large amount and wow. even the ones that say that they're English coffins one of the three large companies that make them in the UK actually makes them abroad and finishes them in the UK yeah that's like the loophole isn't yeah. it yeah exactly so mm -hmm. so there is like a small um, a small market but it's growing I was gonna ask you a question about the families that help sure. uh, make the coffins is mm -hmm. anyone ever shocked if you ask that question or like really surprised by that because it's not mm. a common thing to be asked usually they just order a coffin and it's yeah. there yeah that's a good question people have been surprised when i have asked would you like me to send you a photo or video or time lapse of me making the coffin if mm. they couldn't get there mm -hmm. which is what happens most of the time mm -hmm. i've had i've had a few people uh, send some kind of bewildered emojis <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> you know like what <laughs> no I'd rather just not see the coffin until really? I have to yeah wow, okay I mean yeah or they just will ignore that question completely okay um just out of their comfort zone do you think yeah mm. it's, it's exactly it's out of the comfort zone it's not expected it's not the done thing to have you know, when some people just need, they don't have any capacity for anything different. They just need a, a simple, straightforward of course. exchange. Yeah. Look, this is what I want. Here's the money. You You're going to give it to me. Yeah. You mm -hmm. just send it to this director, mm -hmm. this funeral mm -hmm. director, and that's, and that's fine. And I, like, I, I completely respect that. And, and also it's interesting to notice people's edges and to notice when there's a cultural shift mm -hmm. and it's so subtle but I think there is one happening very slowly mm. you know and you, you can see that from from the amount of choice that's available to to families now through funeral directors mm -hmm. I think that's a really good litmus test yeah the amount of, of power that families have the amount of knowledge I think it's really healthy so there is there is more of a kind of um, a power shifting going on from um, funeral directors having mm. all of the knowledge and all the power mm -hmm. to having a bit more of a diversity of of experience and mm. engagement. Have you yeah. ever done or supplied the coffin for a home funeral? Yes, I have. Um, I think I sent it directly to the funeral directors that they were being used for like practical right. logistical mm -hmm. reasons. But it was being done in their home. Oh, actually, no. What is it? No, I know, I know, you're right, I sent it straight to the family. Mm. Yeah, and okay. it was done in their home. It wow. was uh, an open, it was, yeah, I think it was, no, it was a closed casket, they sent me a photo. 
mm -hmm. really beautiful, you know, wow. like candles and like flowers everywhere in the room, mm. and just like, you know, in the, I think it was the sitting room. Yeah, but most of the time it's, it's a kind of a straightforward cremation. Really? Most yeah. of them are cremations? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think most people get mm. cremated these mm. days, is that right? Mm-hmm, yep. Hopefully cool. acclimated one day. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the first acclimation or resumation um, facility yeah, okay. is setting up in 2023. Really? Yeah. Where? Do you know? I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay. uh, but I, I do know. It's, wow. I've got it in, yeah. Oh, that's very exciting. It is really exciting, yeah. And um, it's really interesting from the point of view of coffin covers and mm -hmm. rental coffins because you can't have a coffin in sure. uh, in a resumation uh, an acclimation facility so you're saying if someone's acclimated or resum resumated Res yeah re resumated yeah. then they could potentially be put in the coffin for mm. the viewing or for the funeral whatever open mm. closed and then the coffin could be reused mm -hmm. by maybe the funeral director yeah or like yeah. like a funeral director could have on hand one of your yeah. coffins yeah. for use in resumation yeah Wow. It's interesting. I mean, the company that are setting up the first resumation facility are um, in partnership with J.A. J. Atkins, which is like the main... J.C. Atkins. J.C. Atkins. <laughs> <laughs> You're on it. <laughs> yeah. Which are the main um, coffin supply company, as you know, in yeah. the UK. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm going to be patenting mine. Pa is it patent or patent? I think the American way is patent. The UK way is patent because wow. you know that's a potentially really good, um, yeah, good source of, of income and sales, and it's yeah. really things that's are exciting. changing. It's really exciting. Mm. Just to say for your viewers, a coffin cover is where you have a cardboard coffin insert inside oh. um, with a, a, a trade price, so it's mm -hmm. quite cheap and um, or relatively, and then the coffin cover is made from like a traditional um, wood that would you know not or, or it could be a veneer mm -hmm. or in my case a willow willow panels mm -hmm. and it folds down because um and these are mostly for cremations or direct burials um but with the crematoriums i don't know if you know but there's this strange kind of myth that funeral directors and crematoriums really avoid at all costs which is that crematoriums reuse the coffins and mm -hmm. sell them on yeah 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 it's crazy i don't know why that. I it's don't know. Yeah. ridiculous mm -hmm. but it's there and it's a fear to be seen taking a coffin out of a right. crematorium right so with the flat pack it doesn't look like a coffin mm, and clever. it can just be carried straight out it makes it um, kind of a little bit more cumbersome because you have to like assemble the panels yeah. and there are like um clasps for the co you know it's all very sturdy mm. and i think like having a, a normal coffin my other I do, which I haven't made yet, but I'm, I'm going to experiment. It's like have a normal coffin shape, but mm -hmm. the foot panel, mm. that the panel, the foot folds, folds down, mm -hmm. and then the coffin just slid out. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's clever. But then as it well. will look like a coffin still. Yeah, so. yeah. Do you yeah. think that IKEA will ever make a coffin? <laughs> oh my god, that's such a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love having this kind of insider knowledge of what the, what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's really cool that it can be. It's like such an old, ancient mm. craft and necessity having a coffin, and it's still evolving. It's still mm. there's still like trends to follow mm. and like things to consider for the future. And mm. we definitely need to consider how we approach end of life mm. care, and well, not only care but after after death care, mm. and the way it impacts the environment, obviously really expensive you know if you even put aside the whole environmental side of it the prices are just going to go yeah. really high for the stuff that is takes more processing and more fuel and more transportation and things need to change fast so they, they are kind of slow early mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah rental coffins you know people did used to rent them in days gone by it's also like it's interesting seeing new trends coming online but also the trends that are you know like home funerals kind of being brought back in again to popularity and right. how we can ad adapt them for modern purposes. Yeah, it's really interesting because yeah. in the in the olden days wasn't the parlor like mm. used in the home for mm. for a funeral like for 
bodies to just mm -hmm. to be resting and mm -hmm. reviewing. Huh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. You, well, maybe it's different in the UK. You know, you have the front room, the sitting room. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be probably a viewing space and like a, yeah, a sitting space. Because mm -hmm. you have the word funeral parlour, don't you, in yeah. the US? Mm -hmm. We don't have that here so much. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't, I it's don't. called a ho funeral it's home. Funeral home, yeah. We also call it a home, but. Yeah. Funeral parlor is yeah. kind of the, and then in the states we have the living room instead of the lounge. Okay, yeah. I think. Yeah, no, we have that here too. Living room. Actually, my grandpa was American, so there are some uh, words that have come through my mum. Okay. Are, that I didn't realize. Like we say oregano. Yeah, in our oregano. Family. Yeah. Not oregano. <laughs> <laughs> someone yesterday, I went to go get a coffee, and someone. I'm pretty sure because they were speaking to me, he said parking lot, you know, mm -hmm. you say car park. Mm. And he kind of like slowed down also when he was saying parking lot. And I'm like, did, did you? <laughs> what did you say? Did you, did you say, say parking lot? <laughs> Are you trying to make me feel comfortable in this country? <laughs> Back to what you were saying about new options, you know, there yeah. are 600,000 people every year die in the UK. Yeah. And like, if, if, that that is an incredibly massive opportunity to shift practices and shift environmental emissions quite quickly. Yeah. If there was something structural that comes in, mm. like policy or mm. you know legalities, um, and obviously you know there's the culture change is slower. But if it comes from a, a recognised body, it's a big scale, but it's also quite exciting because that change is possible. And you know from a coffin maker point of view, you know I do things like. Now I don't, um, I ask the fam, the funeral director if they need a plastic lining. Right. Like I use biodegradable plastic and mm -hmm. I've started using um, compostable plastic, like actually like large bin liners. Right. You know, but mm -hmm. you can't see it. And, and You can hear it though, because I know when I get into my coffin, mm -hmm. it like crinkles. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. people wouldn't be getting it in and out of them regularly. Like I get in and out, so the crinkling <laughs> wouldn't apply. The other day I had a migraine. I got in the coffin for like three hours, oh, and, wow. I, and I was like, "Thank oh. God I have this coffin. It's like the most peaceful oh, <laughs> place that's... in the world." But I was just laughing to myself so... because my door—I accidentally left my door unlocked, <laughs> and I was thinking if someone walks in here and I hear them, I will have to come out of the coffin, and they'll be like, "What is this freak?" <laughs> doing in here anyway um you were saying plastic bin liners yeah i mean compostable yeah i, I probably wouldn't use that phrase to the family or to yeah. the funeral director yeah, yeah, but yeah. they are essentially Lining. that mm. um but yeah I've, I've started saying do you know would the person need a couple of layers of cotton instead of a plastic liner mm. and, you know like so because funeral directors generally are a little bit over cautious about ha not having any seepage they yeah. Pretty much always go for the liner, even if it's not necessary. Most, almost all the time, it's not. Yeah. And like, so what's that like? Five hundred and fifty thousand wow. bin liners, uh, coffin liners a year. You know, like yeah. non-biodegradable ones. Mm. That would even just that practice of mm -hmm. like, do they need it? Is are they? Do they have sores? Do they have? You know. Yeah. Things like that. I won't go into more detail, but... Because seepage, then, for anyone seepage. who doesn't know, is exactly what it sounds like. Yeah. Seep... Seepage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, We're seepy beings. We are seepy beings. We're 70% water. It's just what we do, yeah. you know? It can't be helped. You're saying by just a few more checks, like a few more, um, mm. you know, details being gone over to see if they, mm. you know, some people might not need the plastic. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something called the Environmental Stewardship Council. It's a funeral sector environmental body that was set up um, a year and a half ago. And what it's done, or even less, and what it's doing for the first 12 or so months is researching. It's asking, it's, you know, it's part of the, um, all the um, funeral director bodies. NAFD, you know, FFMA, um, and kind of really structurally kind of um, working its way into the roots of our country in terms of the funeral sector and researching and like what are people doing, what are people's thoughts, what are people's practices, 
um, where are the easy change points, um, where are the kind of massive impact but maybe would require a few more steps to, to shift and mm. um, and this is a direct response to the climate crisis, mm. an indirect response to the Extinction Rebellion movement and like bringing all the climate crisis phrasing into the mainstream a lot more in the UK at least. Um, so it's it, there is there's stuff happening. Yeah, that's so on, good. On the underground. That's very so good. We'll, I think we'll see a bit of that. This is the buff willow. It's unstripped, so okay. it's less processed. You can see um, it's got this beautiful kind of dark green hue on it. Um, you get then, and it's technically called brown willow, mm -hmm. um, which is confusing because it's both the buff willow, which has the bark off is also a kind of brown. <laughs> <laughs> Different no. Anyway, yeah, so because it can take like up to 10 days in the winter to process, to soak that willow, it makes it really hard for um, people on a large scale businesses to make coffins in this way, which gives me a great niche. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and this is the more popular coffin. And so then I also make willow, I bought cof willow coffins from Buff. And this is white willow, that's um, peeled when it's green still. So the, um, the smooth. It's, yeah, they're both smooth, but the Buff willow has, um, has been boiled okay. in, so it was this, and then the, the water's boiled and the tannins from the bark stain these, the pith oh. of the willow. And yeah, so this takes a couple of hours to process, a couple of hours to soak. So it's much more viable on a large scale to make coffins from buff. But yeah, it takes more processing. There's more waste water. Um, so it's more, if you're doing it on like a big industrial scale, it's mm. quite impactful to the watercourse. But on a small scale like me, it's it's fine. You know, mm. there's runoff can be filtered in, in lots of different ways with like um, plants kind of taking out the 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 chemicals out of the water. And you said these all come from Somerset. Yes. So just for anyone who doesn't isn't from around here, Somerset is very close to us. It's, it's the just next the next county, county over. Yeah. So it's not coming far at all. No, it's also in the southwest. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and um, this is so this is a two foot willow sticks, and they I put them in the lid of the coffin um, to make the kind of uprights and or, or bamboo as well. So then I kind of weave around like to make a lattice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we could see on one of the coffins if you like. Yeah, so you can see here the uprights are the two year old thick willow. And then I've woven a, a cross with the first year. So mm. willow gets coppiced, it gets cut at the base of the plant once a year in the winter when the sap is in the roots of the plant, so it's not going to affect the plant. Mm. Um, and then the shoots, so this is this is like one year growth. So if you compare that to like, um, you know, chopping down um, like a 50, 60 year old tree, um, it's much more regenerative. Obviously the tree is going to have more biomass than one, they call it a mock or a, a stool of hazel, um, not of hazel, you can coppice hazel as well, <laughs> of willow, but um, it works out um, more efficient in terms of biodiversity mm. with, with the willow. Yeah, and then so then this is what I do with the white willow, um, I make a plait along the side, I think that com um, complements the, the dark brown quite Yeah, nicely. I like that. And then you just use this like jute rope. Yeah, that's actually hemp. Oh really? Yeah, I started off with sisal, but that's made from agave plants. So that has to be imported quite far. Um, I also could use cotton, cotton rope, but um, yeah, it kind of, hemp is what I'm working with at the moment. Of the coffin is where the stick ends are, so 
I cut them quite flat, but just just in case, you know, in case they need a biodegradable plastic liner, to have a cardboard sheet kind of prevents that perforation. Um, and some people choose to put like, um, you know, sheep's wool or like other fabric that means something to them to make it kind of softer for the person, even though they've dead, they've died. Mm -hmm. so there's something about taking care that is quite lovely. Mm. And with a small scale maker like me, you can. You can adapt that, you can have that tailored experience. And then the coffin is lined with calico cotton. Um, and there's one organic cotton supplier in the UK, because you might not know, but like um, cotton is really pesticide heavy. Yeah. And um, if we can, like obviously it's more expensive and I internalize those costs into my business, but I feel like from a, ethical point of view from a branding point of view to have that consistency but from like my personal ethics to know that like I'm supporting a cotton maker where the workers are like treated well is really important as well as everything else. <laughs> Why the heck do you care about this like being good to the environment and mm -hmm. making willow coffins and why? Um, why? Well, that's a great question. Why? That's a really great question. I I think... Have you always been this way? I was brought up to think about future generations, mm. to think about ourselves as a continuum, and mm. um, yeah, to think about the rest of nature as um, something to be respected and something to like feel a part of. Um, so I'm really grateful to my parents, my mum in particular, for bringing me up like that. So yeah, I, I studied geography and I went into organic farming and, you know, really passionate about like looking after the land and the environment from a like practical point of view. Um, but then when my mum died about 10 years ago, I started doing basketry as like a bereavement therapy um, and kind of kept it on the sidelines. And then about four years ago, or maybe five years ago now, I'm my, so my first child was born. And then two months later, I got cool. Um, and basically my sister had been killed. She'd been bombed in Syria. And that was like a massive shock. Anyway, it was awful. But to have that combination of like new life, it was, it was quite beautiful, really, to have the combination of new life and, and, and death in such a stark way. But also to have everything thrown up in the air and question everything and, like, have so much spaciousness of, like, breastfeeding all the time and not being able to do much else. Um, just really gave me a lot, of, a lot to think about. And I just realised, you know, life's too short not to do what I really feel drawn towards when, because my mum was, um, her, her dying process was quite consciously, like she was conscious, she was talking about her experience, she was researching, she was a, a scientist, a researcher, and she really brought that into her death experience, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, talked to us all a lot, so it was very integrated and very supported, and so that kind of christening of, of grief for me, I had the gift of um, not feeling like it was a taboo, scary fear thing and like actually that the beauty and the coming together that can happen around death when it's done in a held way allowed me to feel like um, actually this is a sector that I would feel really honoured to work in at some point. And there's a little doggy, hello. Hello little doggy. Who is that? This is the, um, the landlord's dog. I can't remember his name. He's very fluffy. <laughs> hey there. I'm gonna be on YouTube. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that. That was yeah. Really makes sense. It's such a beautiful and rare story to like to hear. Mm. Pulling from all your different interests and mm. being informed by things that have just organically happened in your mm. life. Yeah. And creating, you know, a life for yourself that mm. that's very in line with all your values and your your experience so far that takes bravery <laughs> <laughs> and also skill also i want you to i kind of like want to hold, oh, you to sure. hold this. look 
Okay, a couple what of months this? ago, this is an award. It's a coffin, hilariously coffin shaped award. Like, <laughs> I know. It's, it's so funny. Um, I went to an award ceremony and I won Best Coffin Supplier of the Year 2022. Wow. Um, which was a, a massive thing, like, for the whole... This is a national award scheme, so I was, like, so not expecting it. Um, partly because I didn't want to get let down. I wouldn't, didn't want to let myself down, but yeah. I'm really grateful. And it's given me a great platform to be more visible and to share my passions and to share my services. And, um... Yeah, you know, it's not always been easy. I've had people question me. I've had people, like, be downright rude. Um, like, as... So I work part-time with two tiny children as well. So, um, like, as a young woman working in the funeral sector part-time, people... Although, like, I fill all my time with, you know, I probably make a coffin every two weeks or, or sometimes once a week. And it takes me, like because I fit it into school hours, it takes me about four or five days to make a coffin, or six, six days. And I've, yeah, I've definitely like have people look over the top of my head <laughs> and just like not engage and not trust because working in the funeral sector, as you well know, there has to be, you have to be trustworthy, you have to be reliable, you have to be solid and predictable and um, you know, you can't mess up. And although I have never messed up, I also understand why people would um, be apprehensive to startups. And also because funeral directors don't get to make that markup from the coffin that they've imported from China or Poland or somewhere else. So um, there's a slight reticence there from that point of view. Mm -hmm. So this is this has given me some street cred that I <laughs> am happy to have, and I also won the best businesswoman of the year, um, as yeah, in the best product category this year and last year. So just like you know, using those as external validation in the small moments that I question my sanity of <laughs> like yes. why I've just decided to become a coffin maker. <laughs> That's only a tiny amount, most of the time I love it. Got a flat tire. Yee! Flat tire at the beach. Still at the beach.